Let's look at Isaiah chapter 64. Isaiah chapter 64. Here's another proof text of Calvinism now. We're going to look at Isaiah chapter 64, verses 6 through 7. Isaiah chapter 64, verses 6 through 7. So they're going to claim that men are unable to stir up within themselves to go to God unless God stirs up within them first. See, so basically you're not able to do it first. God has to give you that ability. He has to stir within you first because you're unable to stir up yourself. Guys, Isaiah chapter 64, verse 6. But we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousness are as filthy rags. And we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. And there is none that calleth upon thy name, that stirreth up himself to take hold of thee. See that? No one in this world can call upon Christ's name, because they're unable to stir up. For thou hast hid thy face from us, and hast consumed us because of our iniquities. See that? Unless God does something, then they can be stirred up. But notice that God didn't do anything. He turned away. That's why they're unable to stir up within themselves. But look at the context here. They don't read the context. Look at verse 9. Is this referring to individuals today? Or is it some nation? Verse 9. Be not wroth very sore, O Lord. Rem neither remember iniquity forever. Behold, see, we beseech thee, we are all thy what? People. People. These are Jews. Look at verse 10. Zion, Jerusalem. See that? Jews. By the way, let me show you something here. If they insist these are people that are unable to call upon the name, oopsie daisy, verse 9 says they're already his people. His elect. So tell the Calvinists, you know, actually, I'm going to have to agree with you about the inability, but that's referring to you. Say that to them. See how they flip after that, man. See how they flip after that. So notice right here that that's ridiculous then. It does not make sense then. Are you saying that the elect here are unable to believe and call upon the name? I thought they're already the elect. <laughs> One in the world. Okay. Look at verse 7, why they were unable to stir up within themselves. Look at verse 7. There is none that calleth upon thy name, that stirreth up himself to take hold of thee. For thou hast hid thy face from us, and hast consumed us. Right? Why? Why? Did they read? Why? Because, because, because. See, there's a reason why. They couldn't stir up within themselves. And why? Because of what? Oh, that's why, okay? <laughs> you know why? Because they continually sin. That's so obvious. You know what prevents you from believing on Christ? When there's this wicked, sinful heart that keeps growing. And that's going to always hinder you from believing on Jesus Christ. Unless you come to him with humility and realize, okay, whoa. And there's a repentance right here. And there's like a, wait, slow down. I got to humble myself. Don't think that I'm all that. Maybe there's something here to the gospel. Unless the person comes to that choice first, then they can believe. But because they made the choice of continually sinning and say, no, nah, whatever. And when a preacher preaches about hellfire, they have that sinful disdain of, ha ha, whatever. I'm going to party in hell. That's why they can't believe. See? It's so simple right there. Now, here's another thing. Look at verses 6 through 7. Look at verse 6 through 7. Notice that Isaiah included himself, verse 6. We are all as an unclean thing, right? Yeah. That's what he said, right? Yeah. So then, why was Isaiah able to turn to God if he was truly unable to to begin with? Right? Verse 6, 7, and 9. Didn't Isaiah turn to God? But he says, verse 6 through 7 and 9, that, no, we're unable to. What do you mean we're unable to? Isaiah was the one that turned to God. It was Israel that didn't turn itself to God. That means it's not talking about individuals. It's talking about a nation. That's the context here. It's not an individual, oh, I'm unable to turn to God. No, this is a nation. That's unable to turn to God because this nation forsook the Lord with its wicked sin. 
That's why America, it will not happen. America will not be saved, guaranteed. They're unable to. You know why? Because as a nation, they forsook in God with their sins and iniquities. See, this was not something like God did do -do 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 like that. It had nothing to do with that. Therefore, men are able to turn to God, but they will be unable to if they insist in ignoring God and remaining in sin. That's the bottom line. That comes down to choice. See, your choice, your choice, your choice. That's where it all depends upon. All right. Let's also look at Genesis chapter 6, please. Let's cover another area that Calvinists would love to use. We're going to look at Genesis chapter 6. And then verse 5. They also use Jeremiah chapter 17 and then verse 9. Calvinists will also use, see right here, Romans chapter 3, verse 10 through 18. Now this one you want to know. That's their favorite passage. Romans 3, 10 through 18. Okay, that's the one you want to mark down. They will always use that. All right, so these are the three passages of Calvinism. Let's start off with Genesis chapter 6, verse 5. Calvinists, they claim that everyone is totally depraved, that they are even unable to seek after God. So what does he have to do? He has to regenerate a certain person first. See, do that first so that the person can eventually seek after God after that. All right, so here's one example. Let's look at Genesis chapter 6, verse 5. Now remember, if you've done your homework assignments on intermediate discipleship, but if this is new for those of you watching online, this doctrine that you want to be familiar with in Calvinism is called total depravity. There are five systems within Calvinism, and what, the first one is total depravity. It's called TULIP as the acronym, TULIP. And the first one, T, right here, total depravity. U is unconditional election, L is limited atonement, I is irresistible grace, P is perseverance of the saints. That's also where lordship salvation comes from. But if you're curious, you can look them up. But we're just covering total depravity right here. So a person is wicked, totally depraved. Yeah, amen, we believe in that. We're all wicked. But see, what they come down to concerning total depravity is that where it comes to inability. So God has to regenerate, has to do something first where the person can finally be able to receive and believe Christ for salvation. All right, look at Genesis 6, 5. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only what? Evil continually. See, nothing good. It was continually evil. So, this, so man is unable to have the choice to think of something good, to do something good, to make a right decision, I'm going to believe on Christ for salvation. Why? Because right here, this verse seems to show it was continuously, constantly, he was evil. All right, Jeremiah 17, 9. That's another example, right? Because I wrote these three verses down, I'm going to go through these passages real quickly. As long as you wrote them down, then you should be fine. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? See, no one can know it. No one can understand it. To a Calvinist mind, what that means is, see, that's why you, because you can't understand your own heart, how can your heart believe on Jesus Christ for salvation? See, they take it so far. Now look at Romans chapter 3, their favorite passage, verse 10 through 18. This is how they would love to read it as. Notice, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. Look at this. There is none that seeketh after God. See, no one, not a single person is seeking after God. Everyone is totally depraved. See, so you have to have God doing some do -do 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 first so that you can eventually seek after him. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. See that? They're all out of the way. There's no way. You can't say, well, no, there is somebody out there who has the heart that would make a right decision, a good decision to receive Christ for salvation. No, they're all gone. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of ass is under their lips. 
whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness, their feet are swift to shed blood. Uh, verse 16, 17, 18. See that? There is no fear of God before their eyes. Way of peace have they not known. See that? They can't do it. They're unable to. Okay, see, here's the thing. We don't deny everyone's totally depraved. We know everyone's wicked from these verses. But what we do deny is that wicked men are unable to seek after God. That's what we're denying. Look, what the verses are simply showing is that it's just, okay, it's common sense, it's natural, wicked men do not seek after God, right? That verse is just simply giving, as a matter of fact, statement, a simple statement. You notice the Calvinist problem always? Whenever we, the Bible tries to provide a simple statement, the Calvinist always complicate it. I always pointed that out to you. That is always their problem. They read too much into it. They read too much into it. That has always been their problem. It's natural that wicked men do not seek after God. It didn't say they're unable to, though. That's not what it said. Notice Isaiah chapter 55, verse 6 through 7. Isaiah chapter 55, verses 6 through 7. Notice that wicked men, they do have the ability to seek after God. No, they don't. Look at Isaiah chapter 55, verse 6 through 7. The wicked do have that ability. And notice that God wants them to. God actually wants them to. Look at Isaiah 55, verse 6. Seek ye the Lord. See that? While he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. See that? God is saying, come and seek me. Come and call upon me. To who? Verse 7, let the what? Wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. And let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Look at that. The wicked do have that ability. Okay, here's another one. Let's look at the book of Psalms chapter 10. Psalms chapter 10. Okay, why is a natural, unregenerate, wicked people do not seek after God? Why is that a matter-of-fact statement? Why is it natural that they don't seek after God? Very simple, because of their stubbornness, not inability. See, it's their choice. Everything is dependent on free will. It's because of their action, their will, their choice of committing evil. Not because that they're unable to. Look at Psalms chapter 10, verse 4. The wicked, through what? The pride of his countenance will not seek after God. God is not in all his thoughts. That makes sense because of his stubbornness, not because of his inability. What are you going to do when some, uh, when some sodomite uh, flashes in front of you when you're street preaching, throws a bottle at you and spits at you? Are you going to be like a typical Calvinist and say, oh, it's because the poor guy is diseased and sick. He's unable to believe in Jesus Christ. No, because the guy is wicked and stubborn. He's like, I don't want it. That's the more obvious answer, not because I'm unable to. That's why I spit at you. <laughs> oh, that's good. The, the ridiculous notion of Calvinism. I think they have a disability mentally. That's what I think. I think they have a mental disability. <laughs> All right. Another thing from Calvinists. Let's look at Ephesians chapter. Well, let's go to John chapter 1. John chapter 1, and then we'll continue kicking Calvinists next time. Let's look at John chapter 1, and verse 12. Now, I hope that, church, that you are taking notes on this one. This is very important because you've got to realize this. These Calvinist preachers, they're being very appealing to a lot of Christians today. So when you deal with Christians who say, hey, I watch, uh, I watch John MacArthur stuff. I watch John Piper stuff. I, uh, man, did you listen to Paul Washer? You got to listen to him. They're going to mention these preachers in your churches. And when they mention these Calvinist preachers, you got to be prepared why they're wrong and say it's because they teach Calvinism. And then trust me, these people, if they attend their churches and they did a little study from them, they're going to point out scripture that you don't know. And then how are you going to answer them? So you need to be ready. All right, look at John chapter 1, verse 12. 
So notice right here, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Notice that you're a believer in Jesus Christ, but why? The Calvinist's favorite verse is verse 13 here, which were born not of, the, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh. See, it's not your own will. Your own will is not the reason why you became a believer, nor of the will of man, but of what? God. See, it was God doing this do, 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 on you that made you believe. That's what they're going to argue. But the simple answer to this is that they failed to read the verse as it says. Look at verse 12. But as many as what? Receive. Okay, if you did that, did that, notice the next part. To them gave he power to become the what? Sons of God. Okay, there's your birth. You were born to become his son because of what? Because you received him. That's why verse 13 says, you're born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. How can you get verse 13, the birth, to become the son if you don't do verse 12, the receiving? See that? So verse 12 is showing that unless you receive, then you can get that birth, born again son. Verse 13, this was not anything of your will, but of God's will. Well, yeah, no kidding. If you did this first, free will, guess what? Sorry, your will is not going to undo this. If you did the receiving, what God does is that without your will, without your ability, God does this in you. He makes you born again. Not you. How can we make ourselves born again? See, God has to do that. That's all of God's doing, God's will. So until you receive him, then God starts to make you born again. And guess what? No matter what your will does, it will never undo this. It's um, impossible. Amen. That's the blessing. That's why we believe he once saved, always saved, eternal security. Amen. Because it's nothing what we do, it's what Christ did for us. Yeah. See, that's why it's not of our own will, it's God's will. See, that makes more sense. But see, it happened with your choice first. It's not that, okay, you got no choice. I'm going to make you born again. You, have, you can't do it. No. It, will, you decide to will you decide on this? Yes, I accept this. Okay, then you can't undo your salvation. Once saved, you'll never go to hell no matter what. Amen.